Uh, John, you, you talk about uh, the name of one of your books is Sensual Pleasures Are Painful. And uh, that's something which for many Westerners who are new to Buddhism, that's all they know. That's all most people right. know. Yeah. And how do, you, how do you teach people who are new to Buddhism? If they hear that, they might just think, what else is there? They don't yet have faith or they don't have experience with meditative states. How do you, how do you teach the drawback? Teach them how to, teach them how to, to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> what else, you know? Because it's not that difficult. I, I started meditation by, by myself just from reading books. And just follow the instruction. Just be mindful of your breath. And don't let your mind go somewhere, somewhere else. And if you can continue doing this for a few minutes, your mind can become calm right away. Mm. So it's where, for me, meditation is quite simple, <laughs> even though I had never done it before. But when I first started doing it, it seems to be quite, quite easy. Mm. So showing people just how to experience the peace of meditation can show That's people. Right. Once you have experienced the, the peace from meditation, the, the happiness or the bliss you get from meditation, then you say, I don't need anything else. I got happiness within myself. It's just a matter of bringing it out, bring it to appear in my mind. And all I need to do is stop thinking by using mindfulness. That's all. Tanajan, the, the title of one of your books is Ru or the, the Knowing Element. And in that, in that book, you also use another name for this, which is Gai Tip, or like the divine body. And I'd never heard that, that term before. What, what, what is this, either the divine body or the knowing element? Uh, how does one... Well, see, the knowing element is, is the mind, which doesn't exist in the body. Okay? The mind exists in, a, in another world. We call it the spiritual world or divine world, whatever the terms you want to use. You know. But it's not in the physical world like, like, like the body. The mind and the body are connected through the, the vinyana from the mind. You know, this is how the, the mind receives the, the, the objects coming into the, the, the body, the, the sensual organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. And then it's connected to the mind through vinyana mm. in the in the namakanda we call consciousness. Okay, but the mind never is in the physical world. The mind is not in the the world where the body is living. Mm. Even if this whole world exploded because of some catastrophic phenomena, mm. the world will just explode. It won't catch the mind. It won't affect the mind. Because the mind isn't in the world. See? It's only the body that will be exploded along with the, the world. But the mind is, is in, a, in a different place, in, in the spiritual world. Mm. So sometimes we call this guy tip, which is the you know, spiritual body. Tanajan, you, you speak about um, what, you know, watching the the world and the rest of us and, and, and us and um, how we chase after these suffering disguised as happiness and, and, and the true value of the Buddha's teachings as one perspective apart from that. And after living apart from the world and it's, you know, dynamic for so long, I, I wonder how you feel when you look at the world and those in it. And, um, and, and sort of chasing after this and that, like, what are your reflections on, on, on this situation we all find ourselves in and, and maybe even this specific moment in history? Well, we're just chasing after the shadow, our own shadow. It's always think that we can catch our own shadow and become happy. But as soon as we start moving toward our shadow, it starts to move away from us. So our craving, our delusion thing that for us to have things in this world like wealth or happiness will make us happy. But as soon as we catch it, we don't feel happy anymore. Right? We feel that we need something more. 
to make us happy. We might be happy just for a few, few hours, a few days, but after a while, then we feel that it's, it's, not, it's no longer like when you first get it. So you always have to have something new to, to make you feel happy. So you keep chasing after this thing. Never ending. And then, Jen, you, you speak about how, you know, meditation was very simple in some sense for, for you. And I remember reading, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that first year of practice, you basically sat in your basement uh, and practiced alone and managed to meditate many, many hours a day. And to be honest, as I think for many Westerners and perhaps many modern people that just things don't go that's like that completely right off the bat. And I wonder if you did have, what have you found to be effective instruction for kind of us modern overly thinking um, that the situation many of us find ourselves in where, uh, you know, a regimen of practice like that is quite, quite hard. And how would you recommend, uh, say, a, a, a modern person approach these refined states of concentration, what are skillful means we can use? Just keep, stop, keep, stop, stop thinking. And so as soon as you realize you're talking to yourself, it's time yourself to stop. <laughs> uh, you can use the mantra to help you. If you feel you're talking to yourself and say, why don't you talk to the mantra instead? Just <laughs> Uh, focus on what you do. I, I usually use focusing what I do when, when I move, when I eat, when I wash my dishes or bathe or whatever I do, I try to just stay with that and not let my mind go think about other things. I know you've spoken about how the mantra Budo invokes in, say, a Thai person who grew up with it almost the same emotional response as the word God might invoke in a Westerner who grew up in that cultural context. Although I, I may be misquoting, but I'm, I'm curious what you think about the efficacy of how effective it is for Westerners to use the mantra of Budo and what you might recommend as uh, another skillful means to inspire faith for those who didn't grow up from a young age in a Buddhist context. Well, to be honest with you, I didn't use food too much, really. For me, I, I use most of the time, it's just the, the body the, as my, my object of mindfulness. But sometimes when I have to use a mantra, I, I use the nija impermanence. Because I, I, I think I'm, I'm attracted to impermanence. Because as soon as I read the book, someone gave me about anicca, I felt in love with it. Yeah. And also part of my experience when I was about 10 or 12 was to see a corpse, a friend who died from swimming, drowned in the pool. And so they have funeral service for him. He was the Seventh-day Adventist. So it was a Christian funeral. So we filed past the casket and look at the, the corpse. And then somehow strike me right away that this is gonna to happen to me also. <laughs> and just not me, everybody else. I start to see the, the, end, the end game, see that everybody's gonna end this way <laughs> sooner or later. You know? So more or less this kind of, I don't know, give me the, the, the understanding of Nietzsche. But I wasn't overwhelmed or consumed by what I saw. I, I went on, continuing on doing what I had to do, studying and so forth. But in the back of my mind, I know that, you know, things we're going to end up, we're all going to go into that casket one day sooner or later. So, so I get so serious. So I get so, <laughs> you know, so serious about acquiring all the things in this world. Well, and eventually you're gonna die and you cannot take it and you don't know where you're gonna go. I didn't know what's gonna happen to me then because I didn't study Buddhism deep enough. 
to know something about the mind and about re rebirth and so forth. But for me, to me, seeing life is temporary kind of makes me look at life as a, you know, not so serious. What I mean. Kind of John, thank you. Um, during this period of, of COVID, many people in America and all over the world have lost their jobs or have quit their jobs, um, getting some, some more perspective. And I'm curious if you could say anything about uh, actually how to organize one one's time. If one does want to give more time to meditation, should is there a, a specific way to practice, like a certain number of hours per day or... Um, what do you recommend for people for organizing their own time? Well, it depends on your ability to practice. If you can practice, then I think you will want to practice more. But if you cannot, then you'll find it more boring and you don't want to do it. So this is, this is the problem for people, I think, when they try to meditate and they, they cannot do it for long and they become boring and they're not getting any result. So they're not inspired. But if for someone who's lucky, maybe has, has, has developed a lot of mindfulness in past life, to sit and just watch the breath can make them feel calm and happy. Then they will want to do more meditation. Hmm. So this cannot be something that you can recommend to each individual. Each individual has to find, find, find what he, he wants to do. If he is not successful in meditation, he might be discouraged and doesn't want to, to do much. But if he has some, some result, then he will be more inspired, encouraged to do more. And it all comes down to one word, mindfulness. This is the key to your success in meditation. So I would stress if you haven't yet uh, have any success in meditation, you can sit, but you still haven't yet experienced any calm. I think you should try to develop more mindfulness before you come to meditate, which you can do from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep. Try to focus on your body, movement, every, every, every movement of your body, every posture of your body. Just tie your mind with the body. Don't let your mind go somewhere else. We normally don't stay with the body for a long time. Right? We get up and we walk, and then when we start walking, we start to think about some other thing already. What, we, what the Buddha wants us to do is to keep the mind with the body, with every step when we walk, with every movement of the body. If you can force your mind to do that, you will have strong mindfulness. And when you meditate, you can focus on your breath and become calm real quickly. And John, that's very good advice. You, it, for, in your own case, you were able to uh, actually meditate, contemplate death at a very young age, but many people, grown adults, and maybe even the closer they get to death, the more people are afraid of death. When do you actually teach recollection of death to people? When do you feel like, when do you know that someone's ready? Well, you just have to talk to them first. But normally, this is something I, I usually don't teach to anybody. I usually teach people the, the basics. Dana, Sila, Pavana. And and then when they get to the level of pavana and when they're interested in the three characteristics of existence, then you can then talk about death, talk about aging sickness and so forth. But otherwise you, you don't go and talk to anybody about this right away. <laughs> Tanajan, what would you say to a young person or, or an old person um, thinking of ordination? And what would you say to a monk or none thinking of disrobable. Well, there's a saying that goes like this. People in the inside want to get up and want to go outside. And people on the outside want to, to get inside. 
<laughs> so the 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 thing is, once you get inside, you have to stay inside. See? And the only way to stay inside is to be happy. If you're not happy, you cannot stay inside. And the only way to be happy when you're in in robes is to meditate and to get the result of your meditation. So you should start. You should be practicing mindfulness from the from the first step you enter into all in, into monkhood. Don't be sidetracked by any other uh, active activity. Try to focus on developing mindfulness. And you need to be alone most of the time to do this. So you need to go to a forest, well, forest monastery. I only stayed for six weeks at number one and already was anxious to get out from there. <laughs> But I had to be there because I had to learn to, to wear the robes, how to go on Bintabad, and also required to do some morning and evening chanting. You know. But it was just not what I wanted, but I had to go through this ritual. But once I can get into the forest monastery, then once I finish my work, my Bintabad and eating, then I can go back to my Fuji. And that's what I do, just meditate or walking meditation or sitting meditation. And Tanajan, what would you say to a young person thinking of ordination? Good, do it. <laughs> but, but just can you can you stay in it? That's the that's the that's the point. So you have to know what is expected of you when you when you ordain. It's not easy life, you know. You might see if you see silly mommy, you think it's easy life because all they do is just sit there and and do a few chanting and they already got invitation to go to house to eat and to enjoy anything, you know. But for for months to meditate this this is not the way it is, you know. One who meditate has to live quite quite um, in poverty, you know, having nothing except the the, the requisites of, of a monk, you know, having a bowl, three pieces of rope, and you know, a, a water strainer, razor to shave your head, and needle and pins, needles and uh, thread and needles to fix your rope. That's basically that's all you have to have. And you have to practice the tanga. You have to go on arms round. Have to get up every morning and walk into the village. And you have to eat only once a day. You eat, put all the food in your bowl. And in in, in some some forest monastery, they don't have anything else. Once you finish eating, that's it. You no know, no refreshment, no anything like that. All all you have is water for drinking. But that's all you that's all your body needs. If you can do something like this, then I think you can you will be more successful. But if, if you still need to have teas and coffees and whatnot, cheese and whatever, then I think this can be harmful to you. Because even though it's allowed, but it's not. I think what was allowed in the Buddha's time was turned into something else. Mm. I think there was supposed to be medicine, you know, things like the five medicine, like, like uh, sugar, uh, oil, uh, honey, butter, or ghee, or whatever they call that. It's to help when you're sick. But now they, they don't, monks are not sick and they, they, they consume this thing more for pleasure looking after body. So you become attached to this sensual pleasure and you don't want to meditate. Tanajan, on this topic of being a monk, how do you um, suggest that as monks in a country that's new to Buddhism, how do we keep the rules strictly, keep all of our rules, but at the same time uh, hold them somewhat um, somewhat flexibly or hold them spaciously. Like in Thailand, the more strict you are, maybe the more people respect you. Whereas in America, it might be the opposite. The more you strict, you hold rules. Sometimes people are 
think, oh, this monk is attached to rules and uh, are maybe uninspired. How do you do both? Um, be spacious and keep rules. Well, the, way, the reason why we keep the rules is protect us, not to, not to make other people respect us. That's, see, that's not the goal. The goal is, the Vinaya is to protect the monk from misbehavior. Wants the monk to, to behave properly. So this will actually make people respectful of them. What people respect us is because we have this monastic cause. So, but if people, maybe due to the, the understanding that rules is not good, then, well, we, we probably will not be able to attract this type of people to join us. Because it, especially in America, I think America, American despise rules, <laughs> despise mandates. American tribe on freedom, you know, mm. which I respect, you know, okay, I, I'm not arguing anything like that. But in training of the mind, you need rules, you need things to, to, to put a cage to your defilement, not your mind, but your de defilement from, from going out and causing troubles to the mind. Because your goal is to, to bring the mind to, to to stay put in one point. That's why you get real happiness, to meditate. So all these rules were uh, defined, were de designed to, to discourage you from doing anything that doesn't contribute to your meditation practice. So, but but pe people might not understand this if they don't, if they don't really study and practice themselves. But rules in Buddhism, especially monastic court, is there to to steer the mind of a monk toward meditation. That's what the rule is for, to, to stop the monks from going and doing other things. You know? And as soon, as soon as they start to go do something, the Buddha said, no, you cannot do this. So he, he, said, he set up rules. But originally there was no rules when he first started the teaching because all those who, who came to study with, with him became Arahant, they became noble disciples. And they don't, didn't want to do anything but meditate. <laughs> but there was no reason to say how many rules, right? But later on, with people who, who, jo who joined the mon monastery because, of, because they think maybe they can do something, get something from it, and not knowing exactly what the purpose of being ordained for. And they start to do things that the Buddha said, this is not right for you to do. So rules of one by one added from when when a monk start to do something not not that is harmful to the meditation then the Buddha say oh you cannot do this. Tanajan you, you speak about the American mantra fight for freedom, fight for freedom. And I'm curious if you could say more about like the the principle of finding freedom through restraint and through um, yeah looking inwards because that's not what freedom yes. is. Well, besides fight for freedom, that's just another one also for put the pursuit of happiness. Mm, uh, so this, right, this, right. Is, this is where, where, where it is wrong. Happiness should not be pursued because happiness should be realized or discovered within yourself. Yeah. That's what meditation is for, see? for you to come back to yourself and realize the, the true happiness within yourself. But delusion will tell you you have to go after the sensual objects. That's where the word pursuit of happiness comes from. That's why people escaped Europe, went to America to pursue happiness. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because they go and look for happiness outside of the mind, outside of themselves. This is natural for all delusional minds. Every delusional mind will think happiness is outside, not inside. It's only once in a while you come across a, a wise person like the Buddha who discovered that happiness is not outside, but inside yourself. 